Which of these two books are you more likely to read and why? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. For me, I would choose the first book. Now let us consider the same scenario but in a scientific context. Imagine you have opened a journal issue and you are scrolling through the different papers in the issue. You are able to see the title of the paper, the graphical abstract and the author list. Now say you come across these two papers. Which of these two papers would you be more willing to read? Again, feel free to comment about what you think in the comments section. I am guessing most of you would choose the second paper to read. Now, from the previous bookstore example and the current scientific journal example, you can see that we are preferring titles with shorter names. Now, does this mean that the second paper has better writing, scientific writing? No. Does it mean that the second paper has better science? Definitely no. But we see that we are preferring titles that are shorter in nature. Now quite interestingly, I found a paper that says that articles with shorter titles describing the results are cited more often. In this paper, they say that titles having a question mark or containing a reference to a specific geographical location also get lower citations. Why should you be concerned about the title and abstract of your paper? What journalists, you know, people who write for the newspaper and who do it professionally say, is that when somebody, a reader, is scanning a newspaper, you've got basically the first two sentences to catch their attention. Because they start reading an article and if, if something doesn't grab them, the title or the first sentence or two, they just go to the next paper. There's the same fighting for attention in, in science. And a, a nice picture helps because people tend to scan articles based on pictures. An interesting title, something which sort of catches your attention. What, what does that mean? I mean, that, that helps. And then the first couple of sentences explaining what the problem is or what the exciting result is or what happened. You know, the, the, the barest abstract to catch your attention. If your attention is caught, then you'll explore the paper forward further. But everything that you read does have that characteristic of there's this mass of stuff. You have to pick out one of the mass and pay attention to it. And what's the basis for picking that one? And we need to, all of us, compete on that basis. Now, why should we be worried whether other researchers cite our work? It is because the science that we do in our labs should be communicated to other researchers and other non-researchers so that they can benefit from our work. Professor George Whitesides puts it in his paper in this way, saying that interesting and unpublished is equivalent to non-existent. Now, how do you write a good title? Let us see what mistakes we should avoid while writing the title. We have already seen that the title should be short and simple. It should not be too long. The title should be informative and able to convey the content of a paper. However, there should not be any acronyms or abbreviations in the title. We should avoid the title being too sensational because we are writing science and not writing a newspaper. We can also use a colon in the title. There are a few things which you should avoid in the title. You should avoid complex wording, abbreviations and questions in the title. However, I have seen a few papers having their titles, which are questions. You should avoid writing new or novel in the title or abstract of the paper. And you can avoid writing a study of X and Y. Don't write things like miracle cure or wonder drug that sensationalize your title. Instead of writing a comparison of X and Y, a better title would be X versus Y in treating diabetes. These are two examples of papers that have colons in the title. Here you can see that a short description is given, like the magic of linking rings, followed by a brief description of what the content of the paper is. Out of the following titles, which do you think is the best? A. The characterization of the physical properties of gold nanoparticles in oxygen-deprived environments. B. Low oxygen environments reduce the biocompatibility of gold nanoparticles. C. 
Do oxygen levels affect the biocompatibility of gold nanoparticles? Or D. Low oxygen environments promotes the interparticle interaction of citrate stabilized gold nanoparticles, causing them to aggregate and become toxic to biological tissues. You can share your thoughts on which title you think is the best in the comments section. If you appreciate the video till now, like and subscribe for more content. Now the next topic that we are going to discuss is something called search engine optimization. Now it is probably a misconception that the terms that are searched for in your paper are the keywords of the paper. You may have vaguely heard of the term search engine optimization in some other context. I had heard of search engine optimization when I was making these YouTube videos and this search engine optimization is used by content creators to make the videos that they make reachable to the audience better. In the scientific context, search engine optimization is used by researchers so that they can reach their intended audience better. You have to know here that when someone looks for your paper by typing some words, it is the title, the abstract and the keywords that are searched for by the search engine. How does this information help us? It helps us because now we know that if we have kept some term in the title of the paper or even the abstract of the paper, we do not need to keep it in the keywords of the paper. So those five or six precious words are saved. Instead, what we can do is we can keep methods or experimental techniques that we have not mentioned in the abstract of the paper and not obviously uh, in the title of the paper. So if we have not mentioned those words in the title or abstract, we can now keep them in the keywords so that someone who searches for these experimental methods or techniques can find our paper also. So now you know how to optimize your keywords so that your paper can be searched better by the readers. Now let us understand the abstract of the paper. The abstract of the paper is a very important part of the paper. It is a standalone part of the paper which gives you a gist of the content of the paper. If we go back to our bookstore example, in any book, when you look at the back of the book, you see that there is a description of the content of the book. In the case of a book, this is the abstract of the book. And when we look at our scientific context also, the abstract should give us an idea of what the paper is going to contain. If you think about it, unless you've already been recommended this book, the description of the book is how you decide whether you want to read the book. This shows how the abstract is important to attract the reader's attention. In the case of research articles also, the abstract of the paper is mostly how people decide whether they want to read the rest of the paper or not. This abstract has different roles for different kinds of people. For the readers, it gives an idea of the content of the paper. For journal editors, it also gives them an idea of the content of the manuscript and whether the manuscript is in line with the journal's aims and scopes. Many a times, journal editors are loaded with many manuscripts on their desks due to which they may not be able to read the entire length of the paper. They would instead only read your cover letter, the title and the abstract of the paper. So this is another reason why the abstract of the paper is an important piece of the paper which you should carefully and thoughtfully write so that your paper is not desk rejected but instead sent to the reviewers for review. When a manuscript is initially sent out to a reviewer, they usually receive the abstract of the paper and depending on the abstract, they would decide whether they want to review the rest of the manuscript. Now, how do we make a compelling abstract? It is a very simple task and all you have to do is answer four questions. So the four questions that we have to answer are related with the motivation, methods, results and conclusions. For the motivation, you have to answer why did you do the work? Was there any gap in your field that you wanted to address? For the methods, the question you have to answer is what did you do? What was the idea or the experimental methods involved? For the results, you have to answer what did you find in your study? For the conclusions, you have to answer what your study means or what is the significance of the work? 
Here in the conclusions, you can link back to the gap, whether you have addressed it and what can be the benefits of your work for the audience. If you answer these four questions and put them together in accordance with the word limit that the journal requires you to submit in, then you would have a compelling abstract for your work. An important thing to note here is that you should write the rest of the paper first so that you already know the answer to these four questions, then you write the abstract of the paper so that you are more coherent. Let us look at two good abstracts from two different papers and try to find out the parts of the abstract. Here you can see the motivation of the work, the methods that the authors have used, the results obtained by the authors, and the conclusion and broader perspective of the work. In the second paper also, in the abstract, you can see the motivation of the work, the methods that the authors have used for the study, the results obtained by the authors, and the conclusions and future implications of the work. Thanks for watching this episode till the end.